So uh, what a wonderful presentation. Thank you, Marilyn. We're not done with presentations yet. We love missionaries at this church. And these missionaries are no exception, but from what I'm seeing here, you might be some of the favorites. I'm not sure how that happened, but uh, I think Karen really likes you. So we have some special treats for your family. Because it's Halloween, we have this full of goodies. <clears throat> oh, we're not done. You might need a truck and a forklift. This is also full of goodies. We're not done yet. <clears throat> this is also full of goodies. Whew. I can't have you guys come back very often because I can't take this workout. So this is all waiting for you. You might need help getting this to your car or maybe even getting it home. <laughs> Bobby, will you come on up? Let me introduce you to Bobby Sayer, and I'll have him do whatever he wants with his family. But I, uh, as I have mentioned a couple of times already, missionaries are my heroes. These are people who give up their lives here. They give up their freedoms here to go to other parts of the world to share the gospel of Christ. And they're doing our work, those of us who are left here. Remember that Jesus' great commission was to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Not every one of us can go. Not everyone chooses to go. But those who do need to be supported by those who have not. And that's how we partner with missionaries like Bobby and April Sayre. And uh, I've known both of their families. I, I grew up with both of their moms, and they ended up getting married. And uh, so it's wonderful to have that legacy. And of course, we know Bob Sayer. He's come here and, and spoken a, a few times. And um, that is Bobby's dad. Do you go by Bobby? Am I saying it right? Bobby or Bobby. Bob or Bob. Bob or Bobby. All right. Yeah. And so we're very happy to have you here, and uh, it's yours. Take as much time as you need, all right? Hey, thanks for... Thank you for those gift baskets. I'm, I'm looking at the podium here, and I don't know how those fit under there. I mean, that's, that's kind of a mystery to me. I don't know if you guys have some kind of trick going on there like there's a contraption or, do or trap door under here I don't know but uh, thank you guys so much thank you Karen and the missions committee and all of you guys for welcoming us here uh, it really means a lot to us we always feel at home when we come here and we've known the Jackson family for a long time so it's great to see you playing the piano this morning and the whole crew really working together in ministry um, it's amazing. Let's see if this is, is this working? All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, so we're going to talk about Japan a little bit and then share a short word of encouragement for you this morning. Um, I think the last time we were here is January 2019. So it's almost been three years since we've been able to come. And thank you again, Pastor Michael uh, and Jill for having us and inviting us. Uh, we love this church, and like, like Pastor Michael was talking about, what you're doing supporting missionaries in Mexico, in China, all over the world, is you're fulfilling the Great Commission, and you're doing your part as the church to be even hospitable towards missionaries. That is something that is very biblical to do. So thank you so much for doing that for us and for inviting us into your church and into your home. That really means a lot to us. Um, this month is also Pastor Appreciation Month, as you guys have been celebrating. So make sure that you show your pastor some appreciation. And we're really thankful for all of the volunteers here who put on the Sunday service. Uh, it was such a great time of worship and, and special song by Leslie. And uh, thank you, Leslie, for all you do to serve the church and for all that all of you do. Uh, so this has been a different period for us as missionaries and for some missionaries on the field 
Just a few weeks before we were planning to return to Japan, we were itinerating in the States. The border completely shut. And this was a shock to us. Ever since World War II, the border to Japan has been completely open, uh, including anyone in this room could just go and drop by Japan tomorrow if you wanted to. If you wanted to go, if you had the resources to do it, you could fly to Japan, you could get a, a meal to eat and come back. You don't need a visa, you don't need anything. So for the first time since World War II, the borders have been shut for this COVID period of time. And we believe the borders will open soon. Um, we're believing the next couple months. But I want to talk about some things that you're able to do as a church and that we're able to do as missionaries even during this season. And I know it's been challenging even for uh, the churches here in the States. There's been some times where we can't meet together and fellowship like we want to. Um, how many of you guys know it's nice to be able to be together right now and have that fellowship, give someone a hug, shake someone's hand? There's nothing quite like that. Uh, but I'm thankful that if the pandemic had to happen, it happened in 2020, 2021, where we can jump on Zoom, we can talk to people, we can continue doing the work that we need to do. Um, there has been pandemics in the past, and they weren't able to do that. So thankfully, those are some resources that we can do. So we were just in a, a missions conference just last week. I don't even know if Pastor Michael knows this. In Wisconsin, Pastor Philip Thompson, that's Nathan Thompson's brother, one of the missionaries that you support. And almost all of the missionaries to Asia were in a similar situation where they cannot get back to their, to their field right now. And so everyone was sharing these great stories about what God is doing even during this time and talking about also them anticipating getting back to the field. So during COVID, through your support, each month, there are two churches in Japan that are really our family churches. These are churches that if we were in Japan, we would be serving and working with on a weekly basis. So during that time uh, of this season, there's two church churches that you are supporting over there. And I wanted to talk about them just briefly. One of them is a church in the city of Osaka. Now, in Osaka, in the surrounding area, is 20 million people. You can look it up online. In Tokyo, I think is about 25 million, so this is the second biggest city in Japan. So 20 million people. And in Japan, the land mass is small. You can look at a map, and you know this. It's an island, and there's lots of mountains on the island, as there tends to be. And so because of that, the area to live in is very small. So we're talking about 20 million people packed in a very, very compact area. And when you look out on the city, if you're on, on a high mountain and you look down on the city, you just see this valley full of buildings, full of people, people that are waiting to hear about God, people, and the Bible talks about those who are in the valley of decision. And there are, are lots of people waiting to follow Jesus. So this church in Osaka that we work with is a very old church, it's been there since the end of World War II, and the pastor is over 80 years old for that church. And that's very common for churches in this country. The average age of a pastor is about 75 to 80 years old. So as you can imagine, in the next few years, we have a challenge of how those churches are going to transition from their generation to the next generation. For the most part, it's still the children or the generation of World War II that are continuing those churches. And so that's one of the churches. The other churches, the other church that we work with on a daily basis is the opposite of that church. It's a very young church. The pastor is 30 years old. And in that church, uh, it's in a city of 80,000 people. And it's the only church in that city of 80,000 people. So literally, it's the only light of the gospel in that entire area. And we teach in that church four times a week when we're in Japan. And so it's very, it's very strange for a Japanese person to walk through the doors of a church. Um, that would be like if you went through the doors of a mosque or an Orthodox Jewish synagogue. That would just be a very strange thing for you to do. And so for them, their image in their mind is this very formal, maybe Catholic, ornate type of building that they would have to go into if they wanted to go to church. So to them, that access to God is not very easy to do. 
Um, so in this church, what we do is we teach English, and we use that as an outreach to tell people about Jesus. And when they come through the doors, and they come, and they listen, and we teach English, at the end of every English lesson, we teach them, with the permission of the parents, 10 minutes from God's Word. And for those kids, those are the first time that they're experiencing the story of Moses or the story of Joshua. They're getting to hear the Word of God and experiencing it in their lives for the first time. And this church uh, is a really amazing church. It's one of the few churches I know of in Japan that is full of young families. Uh, Japan has the oldest population of any country in the world. Um, they tend to live a long time. They're very healthy, and so it's good that they're older. But in general, uh, the population is an older population. So this church is a great hope for this area of Japan and that they're reaching young families, and the gospel is going out on a daily basis. Both of these churches, you've been able to help us undergird, undergird them with support in 2020 and 2021. And this has been important because in Japan, there's no culture of online giving or anything like that. And, and I know some churches also in America are in the same situation. And so because of that, giving and attendance has been down dramatically during this COVID season. And so that undergirding of support for the pastor and encouraging the church so that they can pay their rent is essential during this time. So we just wanted to say thank you to you guys for doing that and for really standing in the gap. We still have our house in Japan. Our house rent is very low. It's about a quarter of what rents would be in California right now. So uh, that's our only other expense that we have in Japan. So actually during this COVID season, more of our resources have been going directly to the churches uh, in Japan during this COVID season. So. Uh, Pray for these churches. One is in the city of Osaka. One is in the city of Tendi, Japan. You can look up these cities online if you're interested. That's T-E-N-R-I, Tendi, Japan. And so for a long time, many of these churches have been closed down, but now they're all open. They're meeting today. Of course, they all still wear masks in church. Um, just to be safe and to make sure that nobody's passing anything. The buildings in Japan are much smaller than this. You know, here we can, we can spread out just a little bit, but there uh, the churches are very small. I have never to this day seen a building this big in Japan. I mean, this is kind of an average-sized church, but in Japan I've never seen a church building or really any business building this big. And so they really pack them in. Most churches are two stories on the bottom level, is Sunday school classrooms, fellowship hall, the entryway, and on the second story, they have their main sanctuary. Uh, so, and that's also because there's less land, so because of that, they tend to build the, the buildings up instead of sideways, which is kind of cool. So you have a lot of t t uh, tall skyscrapers and different uh, types of buildings than you might see in the States. During COVID, I wanna tell you about some projects that you've been able to help us with, and one of those is installing new carpet in the church in Tendi, Japan. And how many of you guys know carpet is important in a church? But in Japan, it's even more important than here because the first thing they do at church is they take their shoes off. You never, ever wear your shoes inside a person's house or in a church. So because of that, when you're walking on the carpet, it's a little bit more important. So on the bottom floor, and on the top floor of the church, one of the projects we were able to do this summer during the COVID season is to install new carpet in the church. So let's give yourselves a hand for helping us. And, and you really had a key part in doing that, uh, helping us do that. So thank you. Uh, another thing that we've been able to do is they cannot, in Japan, get disposable communion cups. I don't know if you guys have tried using those at all during this season, but disposable communion cups. They cannot get them in Japan, so each month we've been sending them communion cups so that they can take COVID-safe communion. Um, and I know there's different debates about whether or not we should be careful or not, but for them in Japan, in their culture, they tend to be a little bit more cautious, and that's one of the reasons why some of the missionaries to Asia have not been able to get back, because that's sort of the culture in Asia in general. And I was talking with April, uh, really even before this happened, 
wearing masks in Japan is very common. When you go on the train, someone would wear a mask if they had a cold or if they had a fever. Um, in America, we would never do that. But every country is different, and for them, that is quite normal to do that. So uh, for them to take uh, wear masks during church, at least it's easier for them, even though they are required to do that. Pray for us as we continue to talk to our friends and our pastors in Japan. Uh, pray that God would encourage them. This has been a, a difficult season as Japanese people tend to already be isolated. Depression rates are very high. And even during this time, it's gotten worse. And so even if it's over the phone, we're praying for them, encouraging them, offering friendship. Um, and of course, during this time, we're also studying the Japanese language. But when you're praying for Japan, I want you to pray that God would uh, just show him his light and his love. Uh, less than 1% of Japanese are Christian. And really, the percentage is 0.5%, but that's a, it gets a little bit discouraging once you drop the number lower and lower. But 0.5% are Christian, and that includes groups like Catholics, Mormons, and Jehovah Witness. So people think that the real rate is closer to 0.3%, of Japanese are Christian. And this isn't because there's lack of freedom. It's the opposite of China. China has government control and it's very difficult to have church. In Japan, it's like Europe or America, they have total freedom. After World War II, they really modeled their government system after our system. And so they have total freedom. Democracy is very vibrant and alive there. But because of this, and we've seen the challenge in our country and in countries in Europe, there's apathy. Uh, people see themselves as too cool to believe in God or too smart to believe in religion. Uh, the main religions there are Buddhism, uh, which you see in a lot of Asian countries, and another one that's unique to Japan called Shintoism. And Shintoism is animism, seeing life in objects like a desk or in a tree or in your in the bones of your ancestors and that may seem a little bit silly to us to believe in something like that but to them this is very real and it's a real struggle for them even if you look at the at their at their flag you know to us we see a red dot there uh, but what that is is the sun and for thousands of years they've worshiped the sun and it's kind of the, you know, the ultimate life for something that they just think is the best thing. And really, they think it's God. And they believe the emperor of Japan, even to this day, is descended from the sun god. And that he is a direct descendant of the sun god. Not the son of God. It's a counterfeit, the sun god. Uh, so most towns in Japan, there's many towns in Japan that have no churches, or like I was saying, maybe they have one church for a large amount of people. The average church has 25 to 30 people, and that's, that would be a pretty good-sized church for Japan. One of the churches that we've worked with in Japan has uh, less than 10 people. Um, but the Christians that are there are just on fire for God. You could not meet a stronger Christian, I think, personally, anywhere in the world uh, because once they make that decision to follow Christ it's a rock-solid decision uh, we have known some people that it they went to church for 30 years and they never got baptized never got saved but after 30 or 35 years they decided to give their lives to Christ and that's kind of in the culture where it takes them a long time to reach a decision because in America, we can make a decision for ourselves. We'll go home, we'll decide what's for lunch, we'll decide what we, do, what we want to do with our life next year or the year after that. But in Japan, it's very much a community attitude where they don't have the power to make a decision. It depends on their family and what their family wants them to do. We know many people in Japan, they've lived in the same, their family has lived in the same house for 500 years. Now, we can't even imagine that in America, because where was America 500 years ago? We weren't even here. So 500 years in the same house, and their roofs are still made out of straw and mud. A nice house inside, modern house inside, but they still keep that traditional roof. So if you can imagine being the first person in a line of 500 years to decide that you're going to follow a new God, 
that you're going to follow Jesus. Um, it's a little bit challenging for them to do. And we're going to talk about that in the message in a few minutes, how there are spiritual strongholds that need to come down. And you can join us in the army of prayer for this country, that whatever cultural ideas or roadblocks are in their mind or in their heart or in, in society, that they would come down. And we know that through the power of the Spirit, those false spirits can come down. So, as we know, even though borders are shut, you guys know the Great Commission has not stopped. And we are called to go into all the world and to preach the gospel. And no matter what happens, we're not going to stop. I know you're not going to stop. And pray for all of the missionaries that are working in the fields today, that they would continue to reach people and, and really tell people about Jesus for the first time. Uh, we'll talk about Japan just uh, in a few more minutes, but I wanted to get jump into the message today because it's getting late. And today the message is called Death to Life. And if you have your Bible, please turn to Ephesians chapter 2. This is a great book of the Bible. How many of you guys enjoy the book of Ephesians? So Ephesians was a letter written by Paul. You may remember that in the book of Acts, chapter 19, we'll, we see the founding of this church. And when Paul went to the people there, he said, have you received the Holy Spirit? And, he, and what did they say? They said, we didn't even know that there was such a thing as the Holy Spirit. And this is what happens with many countries around the world in Japan. Uh, it can happen in America. It can happen in China. It can happen in other countries around the world where we teach the Bible to them, and they say, hold on, hold on. We've never even heard this before. Thank you for telling us. And that's what the Great Commission is. That's what the Apostle Paul was doing, and that's what we're continuing to do. And if you look at that Acts 19, we're not going to look at it today, but referencing back to it, at the end of the chapter, it says, all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. So this church was founded on a good foundation, and then we don't really hear anything about the church until the end of the Bible. It is mentioned again in the book of Revelation. Thirty years after the founding of the church, the book of Revelation was written to the seven churches in Asia. Ephesus was one of those churches. And I wanted to read this passage from Revelation chapter 2, verses 2 through 5, because it may help us as we read these other verses today. Revelation 2, 2 through 5 says, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But, verse 4, I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent, and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. This is a warning to us as believers. We're Christians here today, but are we taking this book seriously? Are we really who we say we are? Do we know what the gospel is? Do we know our position and who we are in Christ? In this passage in Ephesians 2, it's going to show the, the Christian in the past, the Christian in the present, and the Christian in the future, and what that looks like. So if you have your Bible, Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, and I'll read this for you, and you can follow along if you have it there. Verse 1, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in, what, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, verse 4, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Verse 7. 
so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So if you have your Bible, you're welcome to just glance at it as we go through this. I'm going to look back to verse 1. In verse 1, again, it says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sin. We were all lost in sin at one point. We were all dead. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death. If you think, if you're a non-Christian here today and you think you're righteous, we're really not. None of us are righteous. Even our best behavior is like filthy rags. This is what it was like before Jesus. As believers, we aren't like this today, but this is the state of the world around us. They are walking around dead. One of the ways that you know if you have ever seen someone pass away, one of the ways you know that someone is dead is they can't respond to anything. They can't taste. They can't smell. They can't experience pain or anything else. They're, they're gone. They're dead. This is what it's like for spiritually dead people. They can't respond to spiritual things. They're, they're spiritual zombies. They're the real walking dead. And when you think about the world out there, they're living life as if they're alive, but really they don't know that they're dead inside. But we are not. This is our past. And it's important that if we know that we're saved, it's important that we know what we're saved from. Because salvation means that there's something that we were brought from. Salvation is from sin. Salvation is from death. And that's important because that's, that was what our condition was. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 15, verses 18 through 19, you don't have to turn there, but I'll read it to you. It says, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. So, you know, God is perfect, and we are not. Because of that, we are full of sin. We are not perfect. And even for the people out there, or maybe in this room, who think that we're good, all of us, whether we're a good person or a bad person, are in need of salvation. Now, if you think of a murderer who's in jail, they've committed a sin. But all of us, even the soccer mom who takes care of her family and loves her husband, even that person that we may think of as a good person is also short of God's perfection and full of sin. They don't equally have sinful lives, maybe on the same level, but both are in a state of sin separated from God and eternal life. You know, when I was thinking about this passage, we are dead in our sins. We were dead. This refers to all of humanity. Um, in Acts 28, you remember Paul, he gets in a shipwreck. And Luke, who's traveling with Paul, reports that the natives on the island showed them extraordinary kindness. Now, those people on the island were pagans, but they were still kind. You can have kindness, but not know who your Savior is and not have really been changed on the inside. So just as a reminder that, that all of humanity, whether good or bad, whether pagan or not, we are all in our hearts sinners. In Japan, it's a great example of a country like this. Japan is a country that looks nice on the outside. It's a, a, a modern country. It's technologically advanced in some ways. It's a good place to live. But on the inside, it ha they have the highest suicide rate of any country in the world. In, in, tw in October 2020, they had more suicides during that month than, than they did in all of 2020 from COVID in that country. So the suicide rates are just, just so high there. So, they, And I'm not saying that at their heart they're, they're totally evil or they're not capable of good. Uh, there are some very, very nice people. In some ways, the people there could even be nicer than, than maybe some people you would meet here. 
but less than half of 1% of them are Christian. But whether good or bad, we are in sin. So, verse 1, you were dead in trespasses and sins. Verse 2, in what you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So what is the course of this world? Well, it's not just random. It's designed by Satan to kill and to entrap people. The systems of this world didn't just get there by accident. What you see happening on the news, it's not happening by accident. It's by design. There is a ruler over the, the principalities and dominions of this world, and it's Satan. And he's in direct rebellion to God. And when we're ministering to someone on the street or in any country, we have to remember that these are people who worship idols. Or maybe it's not an idol, maybe it's an ideology. Maybe it's a false belief system that they've been entrapped in. And these are spiritual strongholds. We have to recognize them for what they are. They're prisons. Materialism in our countries, in our country, philosophy, thoughts, ideas that are contrary to God, sexual perversion. These things are designed to trap and to kill people spiritually. The spirit of the world is at work in the sons of disobedience. And we can see this rebellion all around us. How can the spirit of this world be broken? It can only be broken by the true Holy Spirit. In every culture, in every country, there are spiritual strongholds. We need to pray for them in our country. We need to pray for them in this region of California. We need to pray for them in Japan. As we join in prayer for America, join us in prayer for Japan and for China and for all the countries that have spiritual strongholds. In verse 3 of chapter 2 of Ephesians, it says, Among whom... All of us once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, verse 4, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Now what does that mean, children of wrath? Now, a lot of us, when we look at our beautiful children, we don't, want them, we don't want to think of them as children of wrath. Surely he's talking about someone else's children, or surely he's not talking about us, because our kids are surely perfect, right? Uh, any of us who are honest know that they may be perfect at church, <laughs> but when they get home or in the car, they're definitely not perfect, Right? We can see the sin nature in someone by looking at our own kids and, and looking at, our, at their shortcomings. Uh, some people don't want to think about the sin in their life, but I think it's important for a Christian a little bit to remember, as Christians, what we are saved from, what our past was and where we're going in the future. Romans 11.32 says, For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. And the message here is that God gets the glory for everything that's happened in our life. Every time we've disobeyed, he's forgiven us. And only God can get the glory for that because I don't know about you, but I'm looking at all the kings of history and they weren't very forgiving when their subjects weren't loyal to them. But we have a God who is so full of mercy, kindness, forgiven, forgiveness on such a level that we can't even imagine. We follow our passions. We follow our flesh in our carnal mind. But God, he takes that away and he gives us a new mind and he begins to change us. And verse 5, it says that we were dead in our trespasses. It says it again. Now, what is the number one need of those who are spiritually dead? We need to be made alive again, right? We need to go from death to life. In Romans, Paul says that we've been given newness of life. And this is the present state of all believers. We've been giving, given that new life. If you're here today, it's a testimony to the fact that God has done a work in your life. Don't forget that work that he's done. You're not just coming to church and going through the motions and worshiping. That's not what makes you a Christian. What makes you a Christian is the deep work 
that God has done inside of you. And in response to that, that's why you're in God's house. That's why you're passionate about worship. That's why you give. That's why you do what you do. At the end of verse 5 there, it says, By grace you have been saved. It's God's grace. It's nothing we deserve. The penalty has been paid. And in many cultures, because of the religious systems that are built up, they can't imagine a God who would forgive them for free without having to do anything. For them, it, if they have an important test or they have a difficulty in their life, they go to the temple and they clap their hands and they burn incense and they give money. And for them, this is how, in a small way, they can get right with God. But even then, it's not the same loving God that we know. And in some cultures, it's difficult for them to imagine a God who showers them with love and mercy. So don't take for granted what you've done and what God has done in your life and how he's saved you and brought you here today. Uh, but we've been saved, and being saved, there's, there's a purpose to being saved. Even how great that is in the initial salvation and what he's done in our life, it even goes a little bit beyond that. Let's read verses 6 and 7 again of Ephesians 2. It says, And raised up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, looking at myself today, I can say I'm not worthy of that. It's just another display of his kindness toward us. Verse 7, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So it's not just being brought to life, but it's everything that comes with it. We were part of Satan's realm. We were following the course of this world, but now... We are in a different realm. We are seated with Christ. We're experiencing fellowship with Him. And it says in this verse, in the coming ages, we'll discover this even more and get a greater revelation of this as we rule and reign with Christ in the times to come. And this is the future of every Christian. This is what we have to look forward to. Now, when it talks about riches in these verses... It's not talking about money, but this is the richness of his grace and the richness of his kindness. Now, we have a big debt to pay, but that debt is not in money. It's in sin. And that's what the richness of God is forgiving and taking care of, is covering the debt that we could never, ever take care of on our own. All of us deserve hell. The miracle is that God lets any of us into heaven. And just think about the idea of adoption. If there's a family who's adopted someone, they take someone from a situation that's not very good, they've lost their parents, and you bring them into a home, and you take care of them, you love them. Not only that, you give them your name. You say everything that is mine is yours. And even more than that, that I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cook for you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to walk you through life. I'm going to be there with you at every stage of life. This is what adoption is, and this is what Christ does for us, is, is today you've been adopted into his family. You're a child of God. You don't have to be discouraged. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to walk around with your head hung low like some people in the world do. You're not the walking dead. You are alive in Christ today. And again, to remind us, this isn't just for our benefit, even though it does benefit us. It benefits God in that he gets the glory for the work that has happened in your life. This is why it's important that we share our testimony, that we know our past, where we've come from, and where God is bringing us. Let's read verses 8 and 9 again. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. In each, in each part of salvation, there's nothing that we can boast in on our own. Even faith is granted by God. And, you know, if you think about it, every morning that you wake up, even if you're not a Christian, you're living life by faith. Uh, when you walk out the door in the morning and you get in your car, you're trusting that your car is going to work, uh, that your tires are going to be secure and then not steer you off the road. You're believing that no one else is going to run into you. 
even the way our organs work, you think about the intricacies of our body, we just tr wake up trusting and taking for granted that that's going to work throughout the day. Uh, when you cross a bridge, you didn't build that bridge, so you don't know if that really works or not, but we're trusting the maker and the one who designed that. And when we accept what Jesus did on the cross, we are trusting in him and exercising our faith. And we might not understand it all. We might not know how it all works, but we have faith and we trust in the work that he's done in our life. You know, if you think about a person, if they stop breathing for a short time for whatever reason, whether they're drowning or choking, that person can't help themselves unless you put your breath inside of them. And when we were dead before Christ, there was nothing we could do to bring ourselves back to life, but he breathed inside of us. He put his faith inside of us. Again, so that looking back at our life and even how we came to Christ, we can't even get the credit for that. All we can do is boast in Jesus and the work that he did on the cross. It's interesting because at the end of verse 9, it talks about how this is not a result of works. But then in verse 10, he says, we were created for good works. Now, good works does not save us, according to verse 9. It has nothing to do with the salvation process. But in verse 10, it says we have to have good works. So let's look at that, at that last verse together, and we'll read it again one more time. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. So good works are a natural outflow of salvation. John 15, 8 says, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Good works prove that we are who we say we are. And before we can do good works, God has to do the work inside of us. But once he's done his work, then in response to that, we are willing to do anything for God. And this is who we are as believers. This is why you look at all the cities of the world, most of the hospitals were started by Christians. They're all named after Baptist or Methodist, um, real Christians. And this happens because we can't help but do good works. Most of the orphanages in the world, like what uh, my dad's been able to do in China, is those are started because a Christian is saying, hey, if God has adopted me into his family, there's no limits. There's nothing that I can't do for him. And, and sometimes it takes a little bit of a stretch. You know, we look at our past and our life, and we say, uh, am I really the person who's called to do that? But if you're willing to, to read God's Word and to study it and to grow into Him, there's no limit to what you can do in Jesus. So in the past, if you haven't been comfortable with working or doing something for God, I encourage you just to step out in faith, even if it's a little bit difficult at first. It says in Philippians 1.6, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Some people say, I can't stand church. They're a bunch of hypocrites. It is true that none of us are perfect in this life because we're still being worked on and perfected. But there will be a day where we are perfect in Christ Jesus. And as we do good works, we're actually uh, working out our salvation. We are actually being shaped and molded to be made more like Jesus. You know, when you think about Jesus, he was a carpenter. He knew how to take a block of wood to turn it into a table, to turn it into a chair, uh, to turn it into a stool, to turn it into uh, whatever it may have been, a cup. He can take you much easier than that piece of wood, and he can shape you into the work that he is wanting you to be shaped into. And we may not even know what that design is, but if, we're, if we submit ourselves to the Word of God, if we submit ourselves to the work and the chipping away that he wants to do in our life, uh, he can really turn you into something beautiful. Can you imagine if you got saved, but 
but nothing changed inside. You know, looking at you, we might say that you're not even saved if you, if you profess salvation or you just stay a little baby. Because if God's done that work inside of you, you're going to grow and you're going to become more and more like him. And like this verse is talking about in chapter 10, in verse 10 of chapter 2, we are his workmanship. And we should walk in this and walk in the good works that he's called us to. In closing, I just wanted to leave you with some prayer points for Japan, and some of these we've already mentioned. But first of all, three points. Pray for Japanese people to be saved. Japanese people are being saved today. It's not in as big of numbers as we might see in America or in some other countries, but there are Japanese people being saved today. So pray for Japanese people to be saved. Pray for the churches to stand strong, especially during this season. Japan's a very dark country, so if you have a church that's the only church in the city, imagine how bright that light is shining. Um, we were just traveling down a dark road out in the country the other night, and it was just pitch black. You couldn't see anything. But then when you flip on your headlights on your car, all of a sudden the, the, the road, the path just opens up in front of you. As the world gets darker around us, both in America and in Japan, our lights are going to be brighter. Just by the fact that there's fewer lights around. And you're going to be a light in your neighborhood, in your school. In our, in our neighborhood in Japan, we're the only Christian family that we know of in that neighborhood. And so even without having to speak the gospel, we're immediately a light in that area and shining in the darkness. And as the world seems to be getting worse and worse, we need to pray uh, for these dark countries. So pray for Japanese people to be saved. Pray for the churches to stand strong and pray for spiritual strongholds in the culture to be broken. Again, when we look at our culture and the things on the news, or if I look at the Japanese news and the, and the sometimes different struggles they have, they're different struggles, but they're both designs by Satan. He is trying to get people to follow his course and his design. People are not leaving the church by accident or leaving God by accident, but it's something that Satan is trying to do. So I just want to encourage you this morning, as you look at Ephesians, realize who you were in Christ, who you are in Christ today, and even who you're going to be in Christ in the future. That work that he's done in you, there are people all over the world waiting to experience that change and that truth for the first time. So thank you for praying for us. Thank you for supporting the work that God is doing in Japan. This month alone, over $2,000 uh, was sent to the churches in Japan, and that's happening every single month. And so thank you for being part of that. Thank you for undergirding these churches and allowing uh, these reaches to go out. Um, as we get into the Christmas time, we're going to be, if we're not able to get into the country before Christmas, we're going to be doing some outreaches during Christmas time to reach people through these churches in Japan. So thank you for all of your prayers and support. It means uh, the world to us. And if it's all right, I'll just close in prayer and then give it off to Pastor Michael. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word in Ephesians chapter 2. We know that your words are a lamp to our feet. And we know that we were all once dead in our sin. We were without hope, but you saved us. You made us a new creation, and you, you worked on us, and you're allowing us to become more and more like you every day through the work of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for transforming us. We thank you that you have seated us with you in heavenly places, and that one day we will, we will reach that state of perfection. But until then, continue to make us more like you. We just pray that more people today in Japan, in China, in Mexico, in Europe, in Kazakhstan, will be able to hear your good news for the first time. There are people dying having never heard this truth before. Help us to treasure it. Help us to remember the riches that you've offered us in salvation. Thank you for changing us and making us more like you. Bless this day in this church service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's give him a big hand. A wonderful word for us today.
Make sure you say hello to them. God bless you. Consider supporting the Sayers and all of our missionaries. There's more information in our foyer. Uh, there's a computer back there as well as a uh, uh, cork board with a bunch of newsletters on it. Uh, if you don't know anything about our missionaries, all the information is back there. God bless you. Happy Halloween. Go shine the light of God. You're dismissed. <laughs>